Dr. Kiyam for the School of Astrophysics. As many of you in this room know that we have recently set up the School of Astrophysics which will offer an MSc, MSc in Astrophysics degree from this academic year and you are all welcome to you know, serve our website and look at the syllabus. Uh, our outstanding graduate students, uh, Anirba, Norijit and Mitobrato, they have set up a Facebook page for the School of Astrophysics, a Twitter handle and also and also a YouTube channel and uh, we are hoping that uh, we will be able to live stream our talks uh, subsequently but today Anirban is graciously recording the talk uh, that our speaker is going to give today and uh, we plan to post it uh, on YouTube in due time. Now the School of Astrophysics uh, had been uh, a, a project that was always there in our department, in the physics department since 2015, 16 and uh, we are talking about establishing a School of Astrophysics which finally happened but all the background based on which we could, you know, we could project that yes, now we, the success story that we could project actually the entire credit goes to our colleagues and our students, uh, particularly our former students who have graduated from our program. We have been offering, as you know, an astrophysics specialization. We offer astrophysics elective in the bachelor's courses. And uh, so the entire glory and success uh, actually is, is based on the achievements of our colleagues and students. So, uh, so I, I think this is a great deal for me that I, I am being honored to be able to stand in this podium and speak about uh, these achievements that I will proudly uh, uh, you know, speak out. Now, Shashwata Ganguly, our speaker today. Oh, before that I should tell you that why is it? So this way it's historic day. Personally, it's a historic day for me because in 2013 January, that was before I joined Preston's University, we started the then uh, uh, head of the department, Professor Shobhavra Chodhuri, who is now the director of Vaita, started the weekly colloquia, the physics weekly colloquia, and we ran it successfully for many, many years, and uh, it is still running, the Wednesday colloquia, and several of our students, and even in the community, many of our colleagues and scientists have had very high regard for the physics colloquium that we started. So during this colloquium days, I always had the dream that oh one day our students who are you know who are now audience in the colloquium and they're and for whom we are mostly organizing it. So that's why uh, it's a very historic day for me. And so I had the dream that one day these people will become scientists. Well I didn't think astrophysicists but scientists and come and speak in our program. So that was a dream that I always had and today that dream is coming true. So that's why it's a historic day for me and uh, Dr. Shashwata Gandhi uh, who is sitting in the front row was uh, our undergraduate student and he came in June 2013. He took admission and started classes in Preston C. That was even before, six months, four or five months before me. So the first year batch the first year student that he came and interacted with is uh, Shashwato's batch and Shashwato was the topper, the gold medalist of his class uh, and, there, and he had terrific outstanding classmates, many of them are known to you. And then uh, in 2016, Shashwato graduated from our program and he went to the BCGS, the Bone College Graduate School for his Masters and then continued his PhD uh, at the University of Cologne working with Professor Stefan Welsh and he has recently defended his thesis and has done extraordinary work on uh, star formation <coughs> simulation and stuff which we are going to hear from Shashwato and he is now a postdoc, he is just continuing as a postdoc at the University of Cologne and we are greatly, greatly, uh, you know, we, we, it's a great pleasure for all of us, for me and I'm sure for all of us that we have Shashwato here today without further delay, I welcome uh, our, 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 uh, what to say, our uh, fantastic, I don't know, our, uh, huh? our uh, alumnus, our alumnus, yeah, our alumnus, distinguished alumnus and 
thanks our speaker today, Dr. Shashwat Ganguly, to give the inaugural colloquium for the School of Astrophysics, Morphology, Fragmentation, and Dynamic Balance, and Investigation into Early Stages of Structure Formation in Molecular Cloud. So, a big hand for you. Thank you, firstly, Professor Chatterjee, for the very kind introduction. So, it is a great pleasure to come back to presidency and uh, present my work here. Uh, firstly, I want to say that if you have any questions in the middle, please feel free to interrupt me. And so, I'm going to talk to you about what I have done or part of the work I have done during my PhD in Cologne. So, the title uh, which Professor Chatterjee read is rather long. But essentially, the larger question that the star formation community wants to answer, and the one that I am going to partly try and answer to you today, is how do stars form? Uh, so starting from a layman approach here. So how do stars form? Let's say this is a star, and how does it form? So basically, we know that stars form inside something called molecular clouds, or that used to be called gaseous nebula. So take it for the moment at a face value. However, this raises more questions than it answers. So what is a molecular cloud? How does it go on to form stars? So the next question then becomes, what is a molecular cloud? So a molecular cloud, if you look with a telescope, it would appear as this kind of dark patch in the sky. And similar to how a normal cloud blocks, for example, stars, you can see that it's blocking the stars that are behind it. And it's a kind of cold, dark gas, uh, which is the nurse century, the nursery of star formation. And so it's cold, it's around 10 to 15 Kelvin. It's of the size of between, let's say, 10 and a few hundred parsec, where one parsec is 3.3 light years. And it has a mass of, let's say, roughly between 10,000 to 10 million solar masses. So if you fill in the size and the masses, then this will come out to be uh, having densities of around 100 particles per cubic centimeter. And this is relatively dense when we are looking at the interstellar medium. However, uh, this is not really dense compared to Earth standards. For example, if you take one cubic centimeter of air in this room, how many particles would be in there? Somebody? Any guesses? Yes. 10 to 19, 20 around. One water would be 10 to 23, air would be a bit less. So, you know, this is 18 orders of 19, 17, 18 orders of magnitude less compared to that. But it is dense compared to the rest of the interstellar medium, the space between stars. So let's say if you took a rocket from here and you went to, let's say, where JWST is situated right now, the density there would be around one particle per cubic centimeter. So 100 is a factor of 100 higher than that. And as its name suggests, it's primarily filled with molecular hydrogen. This is the name why it's called molecular cloud, and also some helium. The problem of star formation then is if you accept my statement that stars form inside these cold uh, gas clouds, the problem of star formation then becomes how do we go from something like this of 100 particles per cc at maybe 10 Kelvin temperature and climb 21 orders of magnitude in density and end up with something like the sun, which has density similar to roughly water, let's say, and it has a surface temperature of several thousand Kelvin. So this is the problem of star formation that uh, we are in general trying to address in the field. Now, I am going to uh, divide this talk into essentially two parts. First, I'm going to do some very simple back of the envelope calculation. And from the limitations of that calculation, I will come to what my work was on. So firstly, pardon my drawing skills. And secondly, let's have a look at a molecular cloud. So one thing is clear, right? So if this gas cloud needs to increase in density, then it needs to collapse. Otherwise, density cannot increase. So we want to consider uh, a cloud that is, let's say, roughly spheroidal, spherical, let's say. Uh, for simplicity, let's consider uniform density. And we want to 
see under what conditions will it collapse from a pressure equilibrium. So let's say it's standing in a pressure equilibrium and we uh, give it a perturbation. So this perturbation can be many things. It can be a supernova that has exploded nearby and has uh, changed up the gas distribution. It can be some sort of thermal instability. It can be stellar radiation from a nearby massive O star or star cluster maybe. And so when we have this perturbation, so we are considering if we combine both gravity and thermal energy, so if we are considering it to have a certain temperature, what will happen? So the first thing will happen is that you will form sort of some kind of wave from a mechanical disruption. And this is similar to, let's say, when I'm talking, right? So it's creating some kind of sound waves in this room. And in the beginning, you would expect something similar, that any kind of mechanical disturbance, it was propagated as a sound wave. However, what we want to know is under what conditions will this make this part of this cloud or this entire cloud collapse. And for this, we need to uh, do something called uh, simple genes calculation. Maybe uh, many or all of you have seen it already. But it's a good starting point. So let's say our cloud has a radius of r, has a mass of m, and a temperature t. Okay? And then we want to know that when this cloud is being perturbed, under what conditions will this mass of gas collapse and form a star? So one way to say it is that this cloud will collapse if, due to its collapse, the final energy is less than the initial energy. So the cloud wants to go to an energy minimum, let's say, to become stable. So then the total delta E should be less than zero. Now, since we are considering gravity and uh, thermal energy, so we can write this delta E as the sum of the change in gravitational energy. So as this cloud is collapsing, its gravity and gravitational energy will become more negative, and the pressure volume work that will come in. And so this sum of this should be less than zero. Now the gravitational energy, if we just do a very simple calculation, it should be something like gm squared over r. So you know the potential energy of a mass m and size r is gm squared over r. The prefactor here comes from uniform spherical assumption. But it's not really important, and there's a negative side. And the pressure, if we consider, uh, let's say, ideal gas law for simplicity, then it's just given by the ideal gas equation, where m bar is the average mass of a gas particle. So if it's all molecular hydrogen, then m bar is just twice the mass of a proton. If it's atomic hydrogen, then it would be the mass of so nothing so far, right? So we just have the delta E should be less than zero, and we split it, and then we say what is the gravitational energy and what is the pressure. If we now put in these two quantities in the inequality, this should give us a criterion for when this cloud would be unstable to perturbation. And this gives us uh, the genes criterion for class, and this can be written in various ways. So I'm going to express it in terms of density, where the statement is that our cloud will collapse if its density is greater than a critical density. And this makes sense, right? So imagine a lump of gas. Now, if the density increases, then its overall gravitational energy is higher, so it's more susceptible to perturbation. If you have something very rare, then it doesn't matter if there's a little bit of perturbation. You don't expect anything to happen. Okay. And the genes density here is expressed with this formula. So again, the details don't really matter, but you can see there's the mass, there's the temperature, there's the M bar, so the average mass of the particle. And we know these values for typical molecular clouds. So we know the mass, we know the temperature is around 10 Kelvin, and so on. So we can plug in these values, and it turns out that if you look at observed molecular clouds, for them, the critical genes density is around one particle per species. So this means that anything which is um, uh, like 10 Kelvin in temperature and molecular in nature, if it has a density of greater than one particle per cubic centimeter, then it should collapse and form clouds. And we know that typical clouds, because I told you, uh, typical clouds have a number density of around 100 particles per species. 
So this suggests that all of the clouds, they already satisfy this criteria, that all of them should already be collapsing and forming stars. So if I uh, make this in a statement, then all the mass we see in molecular clouds in the Milky Way and in other galaxies, they should be collapsing and forming stars in basically immediately with a very high efficiency. However, observations show us that for a given molecular cloud, let's say in the Milky Way, only roughly around 1% of the gas mass ends up in stars. And that is quite a big discrepancy because this one, so our simple model with all its assumptions, suggested that 100% or close to 100% of the gas mass should end up in stars. However, uh, in observations tell us that only 1% of gas mass ends up in stars. So why is this discrepancy? So this is one of the problems that star formation, uh, the field of star formation often struggles with inefficient. Because if you just consider gravity and some kind of thermal instability, star formation should proceed very fast and uh, be very effective. So why is this? And to understand this, we can have a look at an example star forming region, for example. Uh, so apologies for my non bengali speaking colleagues and friends here, but let's say we take the constellation Orion or Kalpuruj, and we try to look at what is happening here. So this is the same image, so this is Betelgeuse or Adra, and this is the belt of Orion, so you can see the three stars here. And we're sort of going to focus on the Orion star forming region, which is near this Okay. So let's have a closer look. So this is the belt of Orion. These are the three uh, stars, but you can see that there are these two regions here, which are potential interest. The top part is called Orion B, and it includes uh, the Horset Nebula and all very spectacular images that you often see, and hopefully you will see more with JWST. And the bottom part, which is called Orion A, and I'm going to focus on this part because this is a high mass star forming region and it's quite interesting in its own way. So this is what the Orion um, A star forming region looks like and this is the Orion Nebula. And if you show this to somebody who's not from astronomy, uh, they will say, okay, this is the most interesting feature uh, and it is a very interesting feature. However, for the purpose of star formation, the most interesting parts are actually this dark part where no stars are showing. These very unassuming and kind of forgettable parts that you see in the sky map. Until you change the wavelength from optical to, let's say, infrared. So this is a mapping virtual, so it's in part infrared. And what you see here is that all these dark blank parts that we saw here are now filled with dust lanes, it's filled with some forming stars, gas and so on. And the Orion Nebula that you see here, also a bit here, it actually comes from reflected light from the trapezium cluster. Uh, so, but this is where the star formation is happening, also the, you know, all the darker parts, let's say. So let's uh, focus on this picture a bit. So this is our star forming region. And if you remember, when we, when we started with this derivation, we said it should be, we assume uniform density, we assume kind of spheroidal, if not spherical. And you can see that, if anything, it's rather longish, with lots of filamentary substructures, and both of these assumptions are wrong. So this is one way to say why our method was inadequate, that the assumptions in reality are not wrong. However, it gets worse than that. In the sense that so far, let's say we take our molecular plot that we have been considering. So before in the calculation I showed you, we discussed gravity and thermal instability. And indeed, it will have some form of self-gravity that wants to make this cloud collapse onto itself. And it will have thermal energy due to the fact that it has a temperature. However, in addition, there is likely to be some sort of streaming magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields can affect the flow of gas. And also there can be some sort of turbulent motion, so bulk motion of the gas, not random turbulent motion. And this turbulent motion can be inherited from, for example, galactic rotation or something like that. Or 
So the question that I try to uh, look at in my thesis is the part of this is that I wanted to look at all the different dynamical forces that are in at play in numerical simulations, which I will come to in the next slide, and ask the question, how do structures form inside molecular clouds that will go on to form stars? So I don't actually end up in stars, but I am looking at structure formation at different hierarchical scales, structures that eventually will become denser and denser until they form stars. Yes, so we look at general uh, kinetic energy, but on molecular cloud scales, usually it's expected that rotation is not like, insignificant compared to the But we look at general kinetic energy. So, and the question of why uh, we need to look at structures and hierarchical scales is related to the uh, scale of star formation. So, we can look at this in this way. So, let's say the star formation is related to galactic scales. Let's say the thickness of the Milky Way disk, the scale height is 3 to 500 parsec maybe. So, it's several hundred parsec. This is not the Milky Way, but okay, you can get that idea that there's a thickness. Inside which we have molecular clouds. So this is the torus molecular cloud, and this one is, let's say, roughly of the scale of 10 to 100 parsec. Inside which the sites of uh, star formation are actually called molecular cloud cores, and these are basically gravitationally bound entities that people think will definitely collapse and form stars. So this is, for example, in 1.3 millimeter alma observation, and these two uh, contours you see. Here, they are expected to collapse and form a protostar. So here you expect close to 100% efficiency. And then, even at much smaller scales, you will actually get to a protostar. So this is a protostar with a disk. So ideally, if you want to model star formation, you start from galactic or even larger, if you start from cosmological scales, even better. And you want to resolve all the way down to an actual protostar. And this simulation, to my knowledge so far, has not been done. So if you are interested in the field of star formation, you are very much welcome to come in and have a crack at it. Uh, the uh, skills I am going to present to you is somewhere in the middle, where I will present to you uh, simulation results from molecular cloud skills to a little bit less than four skills. I will not be going down to an actual protostar, and I will not be considering galactic dynamics. And I'm going to try and ask three questions. So this was the, let's say, the first introductory part of trying to uh, introduce you to the questions that I will be asking. Are there any questions? So, I have a question. When you're quoting this number, that, uh, let's say this is the particle density for one person. So obviously, you know, you do not have a live movie of seeing that uh, this cloud is collapsing and ending up in stars. But you can make a time, so for example, you can look at molecular clouds at different um, stages. So you can look at molecular clouds when they're quiescent and have no star formation. And you can look at, for example, when they have already formed star clusters. And for example, by, by the frequency of that, you can get an estimate of how long each phase survives. So for example, if it's one to one, then you'd expect that the quiescent phase is equal to the star forming phase. So you can get a time scale estimate, and then from the number statistics, you can get an estimate. So this is yes. Right. And the number density you can get, uh, for example, uh, by, so you, you get column density observations, and then by making certain assumptions, you can get value. So that's why it's an order of magnitude. And that's yeah. Um. So when you observe dust, then it's infrared, yes. But you can also do it for molecular light, so then it would be longer sublinear. Yeah, sublinear and yeah, Uh, I think usually 
what is expected as uh, considering the densities and so on, that GR effects would not really be so effective for molecular flow. Uh, but in order to see, I do not have the numbers in my head, but we can look down. But usually it's ignored. Yes, it's not as Not that I'm aware. You're welcome to have a, uh, have a shot. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes? So I have a question that when you like, uh, when you want to do the you want to do the clouds, you need to have some modern right? Yes. And for that, you are saying something like, like, they should probably do the sound or something. Yes. Is that the without proposition that should probably do the sound or something? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, you can have shocks, which would then be supersonic. So that can definitely happen. But I was looking at very soon. For shocks, yes. yes, yes. Shock velocity is greater than the speed. Yes. Any other? Uh, so one more question. Yes. So when you talk, so you added these things, like let's say confidence. So what is the sort of typical scale? Maybe you already answered to me answer that in your slides. Like typical scale of talking to this stuff that you say rotation is not that. Right. So it depends a bit on the turbulence mechanism, but uh, so there's an upper limit which is set usually by the scale height because you do not, so you, if you think it comes from gravitational instabilities in the galactic disk, then the scale height of the galactic disk sort of sets the largest scale at which turbulence can be injected. So there's a lot of debate about this. Those who think that the turbulence comes from, is inherited from kind of disturbance in the galactic dynamic, then they more prefer the scale. If you look at supernova driven turbulence, then this could be tens of parsecs. And if you look at uh, stellar feedback driven turbulence, then it could be even smaller. And this is um, not the most obvious to distinguish. Okay. okay. Then I continue. Feel free to interrupt me again in the future at any point. So, with these things in mind of uh, questions related to star formation and uh, the efficiency and so on, I'm going to try and look at three specific questions for the remainder of this talk. The first question is related to the morphology of molecular clouds. So I want to know what is the shape of molecular clouds? Are they blobby as we initially assumed? Are they filamentary? Are they sheet-like? What is the shape of molecular clouds? What shapes them? And also a bit more specific question, what is the effect of magnetic fields in shaping the morphology? The second question, which is the question of dynamics, is the importance of different dynamical forces. Is gravity the most important? Are gravity, turbulence, magnetic energy, thermal energy all equally important? Which ones can we ignore and which ones we cannot ignore? And the third one is uh, kind of looking at the hierarchical nature that when we look at these cloud scale parsec to tens of parsec scale properties, how do they relate to smaller core scale properties? Core scale is roughly around 0.1 parsec. So as we go from larger to smaller scales, how do the properties of the molecular cloud, the dynamics, the morphology, do they change? If so, how do they change? Why do they change? And so on. So these are the three uh, questions I will refer to as morphology, energetics, and coordination. And here you can see one of the uh, simulations that we use for our, our analysis, where you can see quite nicely that over time structures are formed. And I am going to present to you results from early stages of structure formation, so before the first stars have formed inside molecular clouds. So where we have a relatively uh, pristine cloud in uh, Milky Way-like conditions. Okay. And the way I am going to present to you is via numerical simulation. And for this purpose, we use kind of uh, hydrodynamic simulations and hydrodynamic simulations with magnetic fields, so magnetohydrodynamic. So these are called the silk simulation. The silk simulation are simulation of a galactic region. Uh, so it's a stratified galactic disk of size 500 parsec times 500 parsec times 10 kiloparsec. What this means is you take the galaxy and you take part of this galactic disk. And you can see this here. And it includes, so maybe I can start from the so 
we start from let's say some initial initial condition where we have let's say density, temperature, column density, and so on. And we have supernova that is driving the turbulence, so the initially quiescent galactic disk, so that was the galactic disk, gets turbulent very fast. What we are particularly interested in, since we are interested in molecular cloud, is this panel, uh, which is molecular hydrogen. And you can see that over time, blocks of molecular hydrogen appear along the galactic disk, and this is basically the formation of molecular cloud in the simulations. Um, and so this is, for example, again the molecular hydrogen that is forming in these blocks, and we want to look at these regions with a better resolution to understand what is happening inside them. And so this is what we do next. So we start with the silk simulation, simulation of a galactic disk, where we identify a certain region, which is potentially interesting, has a lot of molecular hydrogen, and we run this region with a much higher resolution. So we keep the background box, so we get the boundary conditions basically, and we run these regions with a much better resolution, and we get down to a resolution of around 0.1 parsec. Uh, and I am going to show you results from seven different clouds, hydrodynamic as well as MHD clouds. MHD stands for magneto hydrodynamics, so with magnetic fields. And I'm going to show you a time evolution in the early stages. Okay, but, yes. So in this zoom, the zoom question, so what box say the so this is chosen a bit by I. In this case, it's chosen to be around roughly 100 percent. Correct. But we can play the same game. And this is called the deep zoom simulation, where we embed zooming boxes inside the zooming boxes. And implementing and running these simulations was part of my PhD work as well. And with this, we get down to a resolution of around 0.008 parsec or 1600 AU. And I'm going to show you results here from here as well with two MHD clouds, but without a time evolution. So the results I will show you will be based on this silk zoom and silk deep zoom simulation. These are all hydrodynamic simulations. If you're unfamiliar with hydrodynamic simulations, you can ask me later. Uh, and there will be a little box in the top right corner which will show whether I'm showing results from the silk zoom or the silk deep zoom simulation. Okay. So, in the end, once we have these simulations, we need to analyze them, right? And I want to investigate structure formation. So, to analyze the forming structures, we use the technique of dendrograms. Now, what is a dendrogram? So, dendrogram is a model independent method to determine hierarchical density structures. What does this mean? So, let's say we have a two dimensional intensity map or a three dimensional density cube, it does not matter. We feed it to the dendrogram algorithm, and what we get out is this hierarchical tree, where this trunk structure is basically this largest structure that we find, inside which are embedded higher density structures, and inside which are embedded even higher density structures. So given any density cube, you feed it to the dendrogram algorithm, and you get a list of density contours, hierarchically nested, each of which is a structure in our analysis. Okay. In action, this looks something like this. So let's say this is one of our molecular clouds in X, Y, and Z projection. And you can see in blue and red two density contours. And these density contours will be part of the dendrogram tree. So each point in the dendrogram tree corresponds to a single structure that we analyze. The y-axis here is the density threshold, which is the minimum density value inside a given structure. And it's sort of the representative density. So very brief recap, what are we doing? We take these simulations, uh, zoom and deep zoom, various levels, we run them through the dendrogram algorithm, and we get a list of structures. And then we try to classify the shape of these structures, since we are interested in the shape of molecular clouds. And for this, we use the moment of inertia tensor of a given structure. So let's say this is our structure. This is in 2D. Our structures are all of them are in 3D density structures. So what we do is we compute an equivalent ellipsoid, which has the same mass and the same moment of inertia. So this ellipsoid, since it's in 3D, it will have three axes, A, B, and C. And then 
we can use the relative aspect ratio of this axis to classify the structure. But there could be many degenerate shapes. What the same? There could be many many shapes with the same moment. Yes, that's true. So it's a simple simplified method. And uh, so the linear ratio could be there will be not a unique ratio. So for I mean you can have two structures which have the same ratio, but they're both like I guess you choose A, B with looking at the dimension and C you fix it, or no? No, so everything is in 3D, you just don't see C here because of how I do it. Then, uh, as the artist has said, only constant is your moment of inertia. Yes. And you are choosing A, B, C. So it could be completely different thing. There could be many sets of values of A, B, C. For uh, the same for the same moment of inertia. Uh, no. So basically, so let's say you have a moment of inertia tensor and you diagonalize it, mm -hmm. and then there's a unique formula that connects A. So if I A, I B, and I C, so the three moments of inertia are unique, you get mm -hmm. a unique values of A, B, and C. Okay. Are there further questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, so we use the tensor, so we use the principal axis, I can know this, yes. Okay, so we have these three axis lets, A, B, and C, and we use the related aspect ratio. The details here don't really matter. But, essentially, if one axis, let's say A, is much longer compared to the other two, we call it a filament. If all three are roughly equivalent, we call it spheroidal, and if it's kind of flattened, we call it a sheet, and if it's flattened and curved, which we get by seeing if the center of moment, center of mass is contained in the structure, then we call it a curved sheet. So filament, spheroid, sheet, and curved sheet. Okay? Um, is so far it's clear or okay. Interrupt me at any point. Okay? So once we classify these shapes, what do we get about the morphology? So we want to know how the molecular cloud looks like at different scales. And this we can see here. So this is one simulated molecular cloud. In blue, you see one of the larger structures. So this box is around 60 parsec across. And you see one of these larger structures, and it's kind of sheet-like. And this is also what the algorithm identifies. And inside which, you have an embedded filamentary structure here, for example, shown in red. And all of our simulated molecular clouds, we have seven clouds, they are kind of sheet-like on larger scales. So the shape of the simulated molecular clouds are sheets. And interestingly, recent observations using the 3D Gaia dust mapping have concluded that many of the molecular clouds, so here, for example, is showing the California molecular cloud, are also sheet-like. So they have shown, for example, that in this case, that it is a sheet-like structure. So what does this mean? What does it mean that molecular clouds are sheet-like? So we are suggesting that it's likely because these uh, sheet-like molecular clouds are forming as from as shells from supernova, supernova, old remnants of supernova shells. Because if you imagine, let's say a supernova is exploding. So in 3D, you can try to imagine. Uh, there are five members. So and then if you think at some point, so this is a 3D spherical shell in an ideal situation. However, if parts of it become detached, then that would be a sheet-like structure with a density enhancement. So we are suggesting that uh, we are not the first person to suggest it, but the general suggestion then is that the sheet-like molecular cloud are coming because they are forming as uh, from uh, multiple compression from supernova. And what is the effect of magnetic fields on this? <coughs> So this you can see in this plot. So here you have the hydrodynamic clouds on the left-hand side and the MHD clouds on the right-hand side. The x-axis is the size in both cases, estimated from the volume of a given structure, the 3D volume. And the y-axis is the cumulative fraction of different types of structures, sheets, curves, sheets, filaments, and spherons. The first thing you will notice is that when magnetic fields are present, then the number of spheroidal structures is cut to about half. Which makes sense because magnetic fields essentially give a direction in space and therefore they help the formation of elongated structures. 
And secondly, you will see that the presence of magnetic fields also increases the relative number of filaments that are forming. So this seems to be the two effects the magnetic fields which are seen. So the range, uh, so we start from large scale magnetic fields, which are three microgauss. This is in accordance with observations. And then inside clouds, these are of course enhanced, and we do not manually control it. But the different, so the ranges between, on average, inside a cloud, let's say, 4 to 10 microgauss. But it's orientation? Magnetic orientation? Right. So in the initial silk simulation, they are given an X orientation, but the clouds are forming, let's say, 20 mega years after. So it's kind of very randomized by them. Uh, but initially, of course, we need to start in some direction. So this is but the hope is that, you know, through lots of turbulence and so on, part of it is for dropping that. Okay. Um, so with this, I want to then move to the question of energetics. Yes, yes. yes. When you were branching for different uh, structures and you know, sizes, yes. what is the typical density contrast? So the density contrast is essentially a parameter you choose. Uh, and we experimented with many different values. So roughly, let's say we did 10 to the minus 22 grams per cc, which would be around 100 particles per cc, roughly. But also with other values, this was not really sensitive. So the results were not sensitive. So the next question that we come to is the question of energetics, which is asking which of the energy terms are the most important. And I am going to cheat a little bit here and only show you the most important energy term. Uh, so which is actually the kinetic energy and potential energy. So here, from left to right, you see a time evolution of the hydrodynamic clouds. The x-axis is again the size, and the y-axis is the ratio of the kinetic energy over cell gravity. Okay? Uh, and left to right is 2 to 3.5 mega year. Each point here corresponds to a single dendrogram structure in our analysis. And field and empty symbols are molecular and atomic structures respectively, you, uh, counted by their molecular hydrogen content. Um, and these three parts you see here, so this would be kind of bound, unbound part in uh, kinetic virial analysis, where you have only kinetic energy and potential energy. And this middle part would be, let's say, roughly marginally bound. And you see a similar case in uh, MAG simulations as well. And you can see that for larger scale structures, so here, as well as denser structures, so the lighter color, so the color bar here is the density threshold, so it's a representative density of the structures, you can see that their uh, kind of kinetic energy and potential energy seem to be roughly close to each other. Uh, this is not the case for magnetic or thermal energy, which I'm not showing sure here. Um, but we can try to combine the effects of the three energies as well, kinetic, thermal, and magnetic energy, using a kind of virial ratio. So the virial ratio, con uh, so if you know if something is virialized, that means it's usually we say it's in balance between the kinetic and potential energy. However, there can also be thermal and magnetic energies. And depending, so it's kinetic, thermal, magnetic, and potential energy, and depending on the value, we can again define a bound region, a marginally bound region, and an unbound region. So each dendrogram structure will again be a point on this plane. So just for some reference, so what's the value of alpha, let's say, for the earth sun system? Somebody? Yes, so it will only be kinetic and potential energy, let's say we ignore the other two. Would it be bound? Would it be marginally bound? Would it be unbound? Uh, and so yes, so let's say it would be actually alpha equal to one here uh, for the earth certain system. And if you have a comet which comes in a parabolic orbit, uh, then it would be alpha equal to two. So just for reference. OK. So before I showed you the kinetic over potential energy, and now if we add the thermal and magnetic terms, then the picture does not change too much. So we have from left to right the evolution for hydro clouds and MHD clouds at bottom. Y-axis is alpha in each case, and x-axis is size, so all similar as before. 
And what you see here, especially for the MHD plot, that at the earlier snapshot, we have almost no structures beyond the alpha equal to one plant. We have almost no bound structures. And from that, we have a host of emerging bound structures over time. This also happens for the hydro cloud, but it's far less prominent. So bound structures are emerging over time from an unbound or marginally bound region. Now this part was a bit, I, I know this part was a bit confusing. What does it mean that these bound structures are emerging from marginally bound medium? This means that you have a medium which is highly turbulent, so there's a lot of gas motions going around, and locally these turbulent compressions are leading to local over densities which are becoming bound over time and will likely eventually so if I just, uh, so this is just again to say which one was which. So if I just take a stop of the results I've shown you so far. So I've shown you uh, the results of morphology, where we find our clouds are sheet-like, and the presence of magnetic fields tends to increase the number of filaments. Then, if we try to look at the dynamics, we see that turbulence and gravity are the dominant terms. Uh, and that bound structures emerge over time from a marginally bound medium when we look at the real ratio, which suggests that, for example, the whole molecular cloud is not gravitationally bound, rather it's marginally bound or unbound, and parts of it are becoming compressed to form structures that will go on to form stars. However, this does not tell us anything about smaller scale, core scale, point one parsec scale structures. And this is what I want to present to you in the next part with the self equations. So here in left and right, you can see the uh, contrast in resolution between the silk zoom results I was showing you before and the silk zoom deep zoom rents I ran, uh, which have a factor of 16 better resolution and therefore allow us to resolve much deeper structure. And I'm going to look at two MHD plots. These are called MC1 MHD and MC2 MHD, which you can see here. Each black box here corresponds to an analyzed region that we use for our analysis. Uh, so these are all four parsec, and this is projected. So everything is in 3D, and the boxes are simply projected. And further, I'm going to often refer to this as the left region of MC1 MHD, this as the right region, and MC2 MHD. So you will see plots often where it's left region, right region, and then MC2 MHD. Okay. Um, so, but before I come to that, we need to sort of revisit the real equation. I gave you a very hand-wavy term of uh, this is the alpha real parameter. However, now we are looking at much more embedded structures. So it's expected that kind of surface fluxes could become so bear with me here of one slide of math. Uh, so this is the virial equation. What uh, the different terms here, so IE here is the moment of inertia, so it's the time derivative of the moment of inertia, and this is the moment of inertia flux through the surface. But we're not really going to deal with the left hand term, so you can ignore it for the moment. W is related to gravitational energy, which can include both self-gravity as well as tidal forces. And theta can include the combination of kinetic, magnetic, and thermal energy. So if I write it, W is the sum of self-gravity, which we already looked at, and tidal forces, because if you have a structure, it's also feeling the attraction from the surrounding gas in an inhomogeneous medium. And theta here is the sum of magnetic, kinetic, and thermal terms. So the first ones we already looked at, the E B, E K, and E T E. So this is just the magnetic pressure, this is the turbulent pressure, and this is simply you have a thermal pressure. But the second terms, the surface terms are a bit unintuitive. So I'm just going to very briefly explain. So the magnetic surface term is connected to the curvature of the magnetic field. All this is not really relevant for the next part, just to give you a feel of what they say. The kinetic surface term is related to ram pressure. So let's say you have a structure and it's being compressed by some kind of gas flow. Then this one, uh, this will result in high ram pressure and a high surface kinetic energy term. And the thermal surface term can happen if there is thermal confinement. So let's say you have a star which creates a strong temperature gradient. So you can have a high temperature outside the structure and low temperature inside. So basically this high temperature will confine. 
So the bottom line is that uh, we have this, this W is a combination of gravity and theta is a combination of magnetic, kinetic, and thermal energy, if you look at the two. And using this, we can put a condition for stability as follows. So we say a structure is bound if W plus theta is less than zero. That means the structure instantaneously should be collapsing. And a structure is bound by gravity if the gravity term W is greater than the term theta, which is kinetic thermal magnetic. And from this, we define a real ratio as alpha. This is still a bit complicated. So what we can try and look at is look at this two-dimensional plot, where we have alpha on the x-axis and w plus theta on the y-axis. OK? So anything that is below the w plus theta equal to 0 line here means that w plus theta is negative, so the structure is bound. So if we put a dendrogram structure that is on this plane somewhere here, then it's being bound either by itself gravity or by, for example, gravity. And anything that is above is being dispersed either by its tidal forces, if it's in the top left, or by, for example, magnetic pressure or something like this. OK? You can say something was not clear. So what was that momentum inertial class? So this one, so usually, so if something is in viral equilibrium, then the time derivative would go to zero. So then you would get your typical real balance. But if a structure is actually collapsing, then this term would become negative. So it's, it's how, so if something is collapsing, and moment of inertia is mr squared, if r is decreasing, then you can imagine that the time derivative would change. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to keep the structure of this plot, and I'm going to put individual dendrogram structures on this plane. OK? And this, we get something like here. So let me explain. So the x and y axis are the same as before. Each point is a single dendrogram structure from the deep zoom simulations. We have only solid points here because these are all very highly embedded structures. So everything is molecular. There are no more atomic structures. And color-coded is the magnitude-wise leading energy term. So we had a lot of energy terms. We had eight energy terms. And you can see that here. So the uh, potential energy dominated terms are marked in red, kinetic energy in blue, uh, in green is thermal energy dominated, and in grayish points are the magnetic energy dominated. But luckily for us, most of the points seem to be either red, light blue, or green. So this green is actually this one. Uh, so most of the structures are dominated either by self gravity, ram pressure, or thermal energy. So these are the three most important terms when we are looking at these embedded structures. Secondly, for example, there are no thermally confined structures, so light green. I'm not sure how well that is visible, but there are no such points. And this is because we do not have any stars, so we do not have any strong temperature gradients, so we do not have any thermal confine. And if you look at the most bound structures, then most of them are red or light blue. So most bound structures are being bound by ground pressure or self gravity. And we can gain a better insight into this if we split this real plot into the different regions. So here I'm differentiating between the left and right region of MC1 MAT. So these are these two filamentary regions we looked at, and MC2 MAT. And we're looking at the same um, plots just for the separate regions. And what we find is quite interesting. So here, if you look at the bond structure, they're all dominated, almost all dominated by self gravity. So this part, this filamentary structure is self gravity dominated. Whereas this part, if you look at the bond structures, most of them are ram pressure dominated. So why do we have this? And this one is a little bit mixture. So this is quite interesting, because these are these two nearby filamentary structures. One is gravity dominated, and one is ram pressure dominated. So why is this happening? Uh, we can look at this if we look at the velocity flow pattern. So this plot is again a bit, can be a bit confusing, so let me try to explain. So we have the left and the right region of MC1 MHT that we looked at here. The color coded here is the, it's a density slice plot, so I'm just taking a density slice. So it's a single slice, uh, and, and that's the contour here is one of the larger dendrogram structures, which the box is four parsecs, so this is only a top 
So this length is, let's say, four parsec here. And the arrows here show the planar velocity field, with the typical arrow showing one kilometer per second. Now, what does this show? So let's look at the right hand panel first. So here, we see a kind of gas flow from left to right. Then there is this density enhancement. Then the gas flow is changing direction, as well as becoming less in magnitude. And this is essentially this right pressure confinement that we saw. So this structure is moving from left to right, and it's facing a headwind that is compressing it and leading to self-gravitating structures eventually. Whereas, if we look at this left-hand side, which also the algorithm identifies as potential energy dominated, we see that there is no such clear sign of shock flow. Instead, what we find is that there is gas in falling onto the filament, lightly driven by the self-gravity of this filamentary structure itself. So this is so we see two modes of getting to gravitationally dominated structures. One where are smaller scale gravity dominated structures, one where through gravitational fragmentation, and one through ram pressure compression leading to gravity dominated structures. The next question then is do we see this dynamical difference between these two regions, one gravity dominated and one ramp pressure dominated, also in the morphology? So here again, I split into the left region, right region, and MC to MHD. The x-axis is the size, and the y-axis is the cumulative fraction of different types of structures. So sheets, filaments, and spherites. There are no curved sheets here, because we do not get them. The curved sheets we only get because we get these uh, supernova shells, which are highly curved. And the first thing you will notice is that most structures are sheets or filaments. So most of the structures we see at these scales are elongated, sheet-like, or filamentary. But also interesting is that the spheroidal or core-like structures appear at around, so this vertical line is 0.1 parsec. They appear at around 0.1 parsec or slightly below, with this one exception. If and this, and this is interesting because 0.1 parsec is the typical scale of cores. If these indeed are cores, this is quite remarkable because we start from 500 parsec, we only model the dynamics of the gas, and then suddenly, if we would get these core-like structures at around 0.1 parsec self-consistently, then that is in itself is quite interesting. And indeed, you can see that this is the case. So here we have, again, the left region and the right region of tens one and 80 one which is potential energy dominated and one which is ram pressure dominated. So this is a density slice plot. And I have highlighted in black contours one of these identified core-like structures. Here you can see there's a host of these core-like structures embedded inside this parent filamentary structure. Uh, and here you see one core-like structure, there's a couple more, and also a little bit of fragmentation here, even if it's not uh, clearest. So in both cases, then, we see kind of force forming inside filaments, a scenario which we also find in observation. So our simulations, through only modeling self-consistently the physics from much larger scales, is able to reproduce uh, the formation of force at much smaller scales. So if I try to uh, finish up my talk here, so we ask, started by asking three questions on morphology, dynamics, and core connection. And there is also a size dependence, scale dependence on that. On the larger scales, we find that our clouds are sheet-like and most likely created through multiple compressions of supernovae and that magnetic fields enhance the number of filamentary structures embedded within these sheet-like molecular clouds. Then if you look at dynamics, we see that self-gravity and turbulence are the most important terms. And also we see that they clouds, they do not start bound, molecular clouds are not bound in the simulation, but that bound structures emerge over time from a largely unbound medium, which suggests a turbulent medium with local compression leading to gravitationally uh, bound structures. And then if we go to lower scales, we see that also at subparsec scales, uh, the energy budget is dominated by kinetic energy in the form of ramp pressure and self-gravity and that we see two channels of forming smaller scale core-like gravity dominated structures one through kind of fragmentation 
gravitational fragmentation, and the second one where a ram pressure compression is leading to gravity dominating structures. Uh, so, with this, I would like to end my talk and thank you for your attention. So, uh, thank you very much, Sasha, for that he used to be the star, star questionnaire, rather right? the first star audience in the colloquium because he bombarded enormous number of questions and fantastic questions uh, to the speaker. We already had a lot of questions for Shashuko, but please, uh, yes. Don't do that eh? No, no, it's now my turn. Yeah, now you have to answer, you have to answer all those. Okay, so first we have Moitro. I don't think we need a microphone, can we love it? Asked question, the question you talked about the effect of magnetic field on the structure formation, but what is the origin of this magnetic field and how does the simulation work? Right. Um, so there are questions related to how the magnetic fields origin originate. The usual answer is a kind of galactic scale dynamo. So you have some kind of seed fields which are then uh, magnified by galactic rotation. Uh, however, this is not how it's included in the simulation. So what we do is you, we have observations of what's the average field spread, and when we start the silk simulation, so the larger stratified galactic disk, we start with a magnetic field spread which is consistent with this value. Also, if you know more, ask Okay, I just want to make one comment. So we have, we are very, very grateful that we have uh, Professor Patasharati Mojumdar with us in the audience today and Professor Projal Banerjee. Uh, professor Banerjee was one of our alumnus and now is a professor at IIT Palakkar. He works on nuclear physics, nuclear astrophysics stuff. And Professor Patasharati Mojumdar, many of you don't know, he used to be a visiting faculty in our department. And uh, many of our students have greatly, I mean, he had contributed immensely uh, to the you know to academic growth and you know research activities of our students. You, know, you might have seen some of the papers of our students with Professor Mojumdar. And so we are very honored that we have uh, two of our distinguished colleagues in the audience. Yes, part of the question. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. But I just want to go back to the first topic. Uh, so if you take all these other factors into account in addition to gravity, of course it's much more efficient now. But is there an estimate? How efficient are you with all these factors in your Star formation efficiency. So you can kind of reproduce um, the 1% star formation efficiency, more or less, with some assumptions and some stuff you can behind. And there are multiple ways uh, you can do it. So one is where you, the scenario I showed you, where you're dominated by turbulence. Another competing competing scenario is saying that actually everything is collapsing, but the first stars they form, that form, they have a lot of feedback, these massive stars, and they kind of disperse the parent cloud, so before more star formation can occur. So these are the two main competing scenarios, both of which can roughly explain the low star formation efficiency. Can I ask you a really simple question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Um, um, so typically what you do here for these kinds of simulations is that you assume a dark matter halo potential. So this we also have actually. Um, so there is a dark matter Yeah, but it's like a constant thing. So you, we take it from some cosmological simulations and it's just a potential. So this is Solar neighborhood condition. If you have a 
এবং সেক্ষেত্রে অন্যান্য ফ্যাক্টর ধরো অতীতের গ্যালেক্সিগুলো অনেক ক্ষেত্রে তাদের মানে সারফেস গ্যাস সারফেস ডেনসিটি অনেক বেশি তাদের মেটালিসিটি কম এইগুলো অত্যন্ত গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ফ্যাক্টর এবং এইগুলো মানে এটা এরকম চট করে বলা সহজ নয় কিন্তু হ্যাঁ তুমি একেবারে ঠিক বলেছো মানে ইটস এ ভেরি গুড কোয়েশ্চেন অবভিয়াসলি তুমি যদি প্রথম ভাবো যে যখন ফর্ম আসে তখন সুপারনোভা এটাকে শিপলাই কাটার দেওয়ার কোনো সম্ভাবনাই নেই সেটা ডেফিনেটলি এটা মানে বর্তমান ইউনিভার্সে মিল্কি ওয়ে লাইক গ্যালাক্সি থেকে সেটা সত্যি আমি যদি খুব লিমিট করে বলি এটা কতটা এক্সটেন্ডেড মানে এটা খুব নতুন রেজাল্ট মানে এই যে যেগুলো তুমি দেখছো অবজারভেশন যেগুলো এগুলো গত দু তিন মাসের মধ্যে হয়েছে কারণ তার আগে সেটা ডেটা ছিল না এবং আমাদের সিমুলেশনটা ধরো গত বছরে এই ডেটা দিয়েছে ফলে এটা নিয়ে অনেক ভাবনা চিন্তা স্কোপ আছে যে আর কি কি মেথার হতে পারে তাহলে যেরকম তুমি যখন যাচ্ছো তুমি একটা হাওয়া অনুভব করছো তাহলে সেই মাস অফ গ্যাস টা তো একটা হাওয়া অনুভব করছে তার আশেপাশে সেইটা যে চাপটা দিচ্ছে এটাই এইটা যদি আরো দ্রুত গতি হয় তাহলে এটাকে র্যাম প্রেসার স্ট্রিপিং যেটা বলে সেটা হচ্ছে কিছুটা মাস আর কি এখানে ওদিক থেকে সরিয়ে পিছনে তেলের মতো বেরিয়ে যেতে পারে কিন্তু বেসিক্যালি কোনো একটা রিলেটিভ মোশন আছে দুটোর মধ্যে সেইটার কারণে সেটা অনুভব করছে সেটাই হয় আমি র্যাম প্রেসার কি তুমি জানো এবং তার প্রবলেমও বলেছো ক্লেপটারে যে জল বের হচ্ছে তার জন্য যে ফোর্স ফোর্সে জলে উপরে একটা কিছু
not that there's a previous cloud. I mean, this is all has also been studied. What would happen if you have a previous cloud with uh, supernova hitting it? And usually, it's very sensitive to the position of the supernova. So if it's very close, of course, it would destroy the cloud. Uh, if it's very far away, then not so much turbulence is being transferred usually from the rare medium to the dense medium. So it's very inefficient. But it's a very valid question. It's, it's a matter of so there are papers even this year that investigate this. Um, I, I have other questions. Is this then This is case. This is really amazing. First question, the what the first question is that you have to efficiency of one person. Do you have to do this simulation? Do you have to do this simulation? No, because we have to do this simulation. But we have to do this simulation. 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 Now, you have to do this simulation. You have to do this simulation. I am just going to tell you what are the ingredients. For example, do you consider dust? Because dust would play a major role in star formation. Then the radiation field. And also I would think uh, another is cooling, which is a major important thing in star formation. So do you consider all of them? Or? Um, so uh, MHD or ideal MHD? फले को नॉन आइडियल इफेक्ट है ना एवं एस के लिए हम जिस तरह देखते हैं ताते शेड जो ना कोई ना पार्ट को फाव पुली इस टेकन इनटू अकाउंट हमारे यहाँ का नॉन इक्विलिब्रियम केमिस्ट्री नेटवर्क आता है जिसका कोडेस सॉन्गे चले माने इटा को फोर्स प्रोसेसिंग ना सॉन्गे सॉन्गे चे स्पीशीज़ ये एस्टीमेट प शेटाओ टेकिंग इन ट्रैक आउट किंतु एसी मोलेशन को लो शेटा एक टा इनिशियली कांस्टेंट दौड़ा है वो तार पड़े शेटा एक्टिवेटेड होते से दौड़ा है ऑब्वियसली शेटा लोकल वेरिएशन हो शंभव जिसको लो इकहने होते से ना जिसको इकहने एक नो उसकी स्टार्स फॉर्म करें तो पहले स्टार्स के रेडिएशन डास्ट इंक्लूडेड एक बार जब पुलिंग एक जोड़ो कंसीडर करा है क्योंकि एक्सप्लिसिटली आपने जो दिवाले डास्ट के फ्लूइड इस अवे ट्रीट करा चुके ना तब चार्ज कंसीडर करा चुके कि ना शेटा फॉर्म करा। एंड माय लास्ट क्वेश्चन इज वन परसेंट एफिशिएंस इन नाउ एडे मॉडिफिकेशन बट इन आधार when the surface density of the gas is much higher, then you expect gravity to play a more dominant role. So that would be the case, for example, in the central molecular zone. Uh, so it can be the case, uh, or it is most likely the case, that in certain high surface density galaxies where there's a lot of more molecular gas, then the formation, so rather than supernova, maybe kind of gravitational instability from larger scales is the major dominating mechanism. Yes, that is correct. So parts, so she from within sheet we have filaments, within filaments we have pores, and usually these pores are said to be the size of stars. So the one person which is very low core you can that automatically you can Yeah, exactly. And then the core which was larger, can one say that that's forming from a more massive star or is that a very nice Um it, it is possible. So it is not possible to say from these simulations. Uh, so it, it, it is likely that most of these pores will form at least several stars, uh, both massive and low mass stars. Usually in these simulations, we only take into account massive stars because we care for the feedback. But for example, if you wanted to do binary statistics, if you wanted to do other things, you would need to do that. Or if you wanted to resolve the IMF, uh, the initial mass function, to see what, how many stars are forming. But this is the beyond the scope of these simulations. Usually those simulations start from a core scale simulation. Start from core scale, and then you see with some perturbation which stars are forming, how massive, so on and so forth. Uh, but from a larger scale, to my knowledge, this work is very complete. 
So this can also be this can also be due to the complicated geometry of the clouds. So that can be one thing because you know there's lots of line of sight effects, right? It's not an ideal spherical cloud. So even if let's say you have some sort of overall rotation, maybe this does not show up. So that's that's another way of looking at it. But generally, you do not see any clear. So, uh, so in that case, you need to start with the molecular cloud because here, you know, we are not giving anything to form the molecular cloud. So we are just starting with a larger scale environment, just driving supernova, and we get molecular cloud. We are we have no control over the properties of the cloud themselves in that sense. So I think you would need to start with a smaller scale simulation, give a rotation, and see. I. I there must be work like this, but I cannot remember right now. I don't have a That's a good point. Is this? I think it's a cosmological simulation. I took. Supernova is going to include Kodama, supernova energy there, I would say. How you distribute the energy, that's very important. Otherwise, it immediately cools off. You don't see any impact. Is this, in your case, also important um, or not? Yes, so you need to resolve basically the state of Taylor phase of the supernova. Otherwise, as you said, it will immediately cool down. So what we usually do is, uh, if the supernova, if it's not resolved, the state of Taylor phase, that means um, so so that means your state of Taylor phase is, is within one cell. So if we do not resolve it by four or eight cells or something, then you do a momentum-driven feedback instead of the energy-driven feedback, where you assume that the energy will go into cooling, but the momentum of the gas will remain, so you part momentum into the nearby cell. So the prescription is the same, more or less. Okay. Uh, yes, Arif? Yeah. Uh, in this talk, you said that there are four types of gas cells, spherical, sheet, carb sheet, and uh, filler. But in the final result, there are no curves. Ah, so in a deep room. So these are a uh, much smaller scale. So if you look here, so this is maybe one parsec is the largest scale. Whereas in the beginning when I showed you, they were 20 parsec or 30 parsec. So we get curve sheets on these large scales. Because imagine a supernova has exploded and you have this sheet which is curved because it's part of the shell. However, when you're looking at parts of it, then this curved nature is not that far. That's why in the, when we're looking at embedded environments, we do not see this. So you can think, right? If you take a curve sheet and you take a cross section, a part of it, then this will not necessarily appear in the curve sheet. And another thing is, uh, in the curve sheet, you are saying that the source is uh, because you do a super, right? Sorry? Uh, the curve sheet. The <laughs> curve base is coming into the super from the outside. So it's not there any effect of outside stars, that are outside of the gas clouds. What kind of effect are you looking for? Kind of stellar feedback or? In star formation, will there be any effect of the outside stars? Um, so stars affect, so stars can affect gravitationally, but this is not usually so important. I mean, we have a whole stellar population, which kind of you uh, estimate the potential due to this. Um, so this is existing stars, basically. But then you can have stellar feedback effects, and these could be radiation. So, for example, ionizing radiation can be stellar winds and uh, radiation pressure, stuff like this. And when we do have massive stars, we do take into account these things. Uh, but here, basically, uh, we are so 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 yeah. So it's a bit numerical prescription. Let's say you explode the supernova randomly, and then inside the molecular cloud, you're tracing the massive stars. Once the massive stars form, they will definitely affect the gas around. So you will try to start getting these H2 bubbles uh, inside molecular cloud, where part of the molecular cloud becomes ionized and so on. So this definitely happens. But because we're looking at relatively early stages, um, so these stars have not formed yet. Outside, you have a rarefied medium. So it's, it, usually, you do not have so many massive stars yet, because they need to form inside molecular clouds. right? Any other questions? Yes, yes, for the please. Uh, yeah, the, is there a change in the uh, theoretically expected like, where the microstar is started to form inside the molecular cloud? Driven by the solution. Mm -hmm. Does the mass distribution mass of you know, stars that will form, will it change once you have uh, different kinds of like, the stars forming inside the molecular cloud? Will you form low mass stars or will you gradually form? Um, so 
ideally you would do all this self consistently, but what we do is basically we assume an initial mass function. So let's say you have something we call sig particles, which are proxy for stars or star clusters. And essentially what we do is we accumulate mass into this uh, sig particle, and then you take a typical IMF, which is let's say uh, the Kumba IMF or something, and this says that out of every 120 solar mass, you will have one massive star. So once these uh, sink particles attain 120 solar mass, we uh, say, okay, one massive star has now formed, and we give feedback. So this is not a fully self-consistent uh, method, uh, and we definitely do not trace uh, low mass stars. Uh, but they have less impact in terms of feedback, which is our main interest. So the molecule says it's a dynamic Yes. Yes, then we'll form. Yes, yes, then we'll form. So you would often even disperse the entire cloud. If you don't disperse that cloud, then you can get partially triggered star formation, similar to how the supernova is doing. So these both things happen, and we have seen both things happen. So in certain cases, the entire clouds get destroyed before a second generation of stars form. And in certain cases, you also get some triggered star formation. But since we only trace massive stars, we are not really able to say, you know, why it's just for the lowest. I was saying that you showed some observation at the very beginning and then you got in the deep end of your simulation. So has ALMA provided a lot of constraints for this kind of simulations or you, you still have a lot of freedom? Um, ALMA has provided a lot of um, insights. So for example, first thing is it has shown us that there's a lot of substructure inside cores. It has talked a lot about the real balance between cores. But this turbulence versus gravity, whether molecular clouds are bound or not, this does not seem to be resolved. Also because ALMA is looking usually at smaller scales because it's an interferometer. So for larger scales, you need to combine it with single dish and so on. And uh, this debate is still on. I remember seeing a lot of signature of shock gas in uh, star forming cores uh, from one of my classmates in grad school who mm -hmm. uh, defended his thesis at the same month in the view. And I'm happy to see that, I mean, I'm sure there was simulation before, but this simulation is clearly showing that etc. Yeah, yeah. That's there, there's a lot of shocks. There's shocks everywhere. There's too many shocks, if anything. Okay. I hope that they're not shocked. Yeah. So <laughs> any, any other questions? Any more questions? Uh, it's OK. So I think, uh, I think the Shashatab, uh, is your appetite